Welcome to 30 Minute Reviews. I am Adam. Um, this week's schedule is going to get a little wonky. I had two movies that I was going to see because Flea is coming out and also um, there's a GameStop documentary. Now, issue is we have a blizzard impending on Friday night, which we're not going to go see GameStop. Flea is probably not going to be interrupted, but um, the GameStop probably, probably is. Um, it is freezing right now. It is 23 degrees. I am cold. I am tired. Um, and, and the thing is, too, with this blizzard, it's like, you gotta commend the fucking, the Weather Channel app. Now, I have the Weather Channel app. That's my, my app of choice for weather. I downloaded it special instead of using the stock Android or, or Galaxy weather app for, I don't even know why I did that anymore. Um, but I downloaded it. And number one, it is the most annoying app on the planet. Um, in terms of just random bullshit that you don't need, where it's like, here's a local interest story, like, on the other side of the country, it's like, I don't give a fuck, like, you know, and I disable all the notifications, but it still sends these through every once in a while, and every time they do, it freezes my phone up, where, uh, if it's locked, when, and that notification comes in, for whatever reason, no matter what it is, or what my phone is doing, it always freezes the phone up. So here we are. Uh, and then on top of it, it's like, you go in, it's like, I just want to see a snowfall estimate for how much snow we're expecting to get over a 24-hour period. Like, that's a pretty mundane request, and I feel like it's the information that's most needed for anyone who's looking at the Weather Channel app. Like, I don't think anyone who's looking at it is like, hmm, how much is the barometric pressure going to fall in 24 hours? Is this technically a bomb cyclone, or is it just a clusterfuck of snow? Does it matter? No, it does. It really doesn't fucking matter to me. Like, it could be a blizzard, it could be a bomb cyclone, it could be a nor'easter. I don't care about the semantics of what it is or why it's happening. In the broader sense, yes, but in the specific sense of me getting ready to uh, handle this snowstorm, I don't give a fuck about any of that. I really don't. What I want is relevant information. How much snow am I getting? When is the snow going to be done? And by the time the snow ends, is it going to be cold enough or, or warm enough during and then cold enough after where there's going to be fucking ice everywhere? Because that's what's important information in the lead up to the snow. Um, not, you know, here's the barometric pressure, here's the temperature it's going to be, you know, consistently. And it's like, just give me, like, especially this far out where it's like the snowstorm is hitting Friday night and it's currently Wednesday night. So presumably in, in what's it called, we'll have the snowfall beginning um, in 48 hours from right now. Um, so, like, yeah, that that's going to, that's going to happen. The snow is going to fall. The problem is, um, I, I don't understand why this snowfall needs to be, um, like, done the way it is. And I'm getting way off topic. That's not what we're here to talk about. What we're here to talk about is a continuation of our conversation about backward compatibility and us, the gaming community. Um, more so other people than me, because I don't really play too many games too often, um, besides my, my usual staples, like the big franchise games and Nintendo I'll still play, uh, and I'm, I'll, I'm known to, to dive into an indie every once in a while, like unpacking, I dove into pretty deeply, um, Snakey Bus is pretty fun too, um, but yeah, so like, you know, I, I want to talk about backward compatibility again, because... You know, ever since that patent was uncovered um, with PlayStation, every little thing that PlayStation does is being unpacked and, and, and being, you know, m like, looked at under a microscope. Like, is this a hint that they're doing back compatibility? Is this a hint? And it's like watching, you know, a QAnon conspiracy theorist try to tell us, you know, what's going on, which, you know, whatever. Uh, like, you know, and here's the hint that this is happening, and it's here... And here's what's going on. And here, like, okay, whatever. Um, and, and it's like, yeah, uh, th they would just announce it if they were doing this. It's like, they're not going to sit here and play this game of like, ooh, are we going to announce it in the future? Or, ooh, is this coming? Or what's going on? It's like, no, they're going to announce it when it comes closer to the time that it, it's worth announcing. Now, herein lies the, the big question, though. Are they going to do it? I was previously of the idea that... No, they're not going to do it because financially, for 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 Sony, it doesn't make sense for them to to do back compatibility. Like, it, it really doesn't because if I'm doing back compatibility, that means I can't sell you a remaster as easily because I can go to a used game store and buy it used for for under ten dollars for certain games. 
Um, and, and there is a slight issue with that. Like, you know, the, the markets for these games change on a dime, and, and there is a certain level of, like, look, you're, you're going... Like, I went to... The day that the Xbox back compatibility for Battlefront and Battlefront 2 got announced, Star Wars Battlefront and Battlefront 2, which are, I think, to this day, two of my favorite games from my childhood. Um, the day those got announced, I ran out to my little game store and, and went to buy them and he's like what's with the rush and, and, and first of all the guy the guy running it was like what's with the rush of these games like you, like so many people are buying these games I bought Mercenaries uh, the first Mercenaries game Mercenaries World in, uh, World no Mercenaries 2 was World in Flames or Mercenaries 1 Mercenaries 1 didn't have a subtitle maybe Mercenaries 2 was definitely World in Flames but Mercenaries I went out and bought that I went out and bought uh, Battlefront because he was out of Battlefront 2 but I bought Battlefront um for the Xbox, and he's like, what's going on, like, what's going on, I'm like, well, while you were open, they announced that these games are going back compatible, and if you have this, the disc, you don't have to pay the Xbox rate to play the game, and it was like, oh, shit, that's awesome, um, because then he was able to mark the game up to the full retail price that they were charging on the Xbox store, because why shouldn't he, but here's the problem, is that if we're gonna make it a, a, a world in which games are backward compatible, um, it functionally creates a world in which the the ROM market on the internet um, is where you can find and play old games. That basically goes away. That that world, um, because that's a, and, and that's I think a problem. Because look, at, at this point, you know we can. I, I think the only fair comparison between movies and, and video games is the distribution method, and, you know, when we look at a video game and how the video game market is handled upgrading, it's like, they're doing it, you know, moderately well. They're doing it better than movies ever did. Like, if I bought a, um, uh, a, what's it called, a, a digital, like, a, if I bought a VHS of, I don't know, Star Wars, um, and then I, like... I watched it. There was no obligation by Fox at the time to send me a free copy of the DVD because I already owned it. I mean, and people are complaining like, oh, well, I just bought this game on this. I should be able to play it on both. And it's like, well, that's not exactly how it works. Um, like, if it's a digital copy of the game um, and, and there is no substantive difference between the two, which there definitely is. I mean, there's definitely a substantive difference between the two just because of the processing power behind the next-gen version of the game. Like, if we're going to look at what is um, a, what is possible on a PlayStation 5 compared to a PlayStation 4, just on that alone, it's a completely different animal that they're dealing with. And I think that that's kind of something that's worth addressing in a weird way. Um, but I feel like the, the, the issue is, if we make it where, you know, we're going to do back compatibility across the board, number one, it's going to make it where it's harder now for the purpose of... You know, we, when we look at films, and we look at film history, it's like, yeah, it's only $20 for a movie. Like, for, if you go and buy a new release movie, you will pay, on DVD, $20, on Blu-ray, $25, on 4K, $30. Um, and they're available on, on streaming. If you go on stream, you can do that. Um, gaming doesn't have the streaming ability because the majority of Americans don't have an internet connection that can handle it. And there are a few other systemic issues in place with gaming on streaming that make it a little bit more difficult, to say the least. Um, so while, you know, that may be a ways away, the the issue that that is, is endemic with this is prosperity and, and keeping the keeping games available for people for, for study, for for pop culture study, for, for things like that. And it's like, look, everything else that has been commoditized in American history is made readily available and, and made easily available and made to a point where from an academic standpoint we can look at it and be like, hey, this is easy to get. Um, video games don't have that in a weird way. Like, we can go and we can listen to music dating back as long as there have been record players. We can watch movies for as long as movies have been around. I bought a movie on Black Friday. It was uh, The Kings of Jazz, it's called. It's one of the first color movies ever made. It's one of Bing Crosby's first movies ever made. But I was able to buy it. The movie's almost 100 years old, and I own a physical Blu-ray of it that I bought through Criterion. Um, 
there needs to be a company like that that is aimed at, you know, for posterity saving these games and being like, look, this is what happened. And I think to an extent, game companies don't want to necessarily do that because they don't want to point to what they did in the past and be like, this is how good it was. And if they don't meet those criteria, it's a little bit harder. And back compatibility is something that, like, you know, people are going to look at and be like, oh, look, now I can play this. I can be like, oh, this is better. I can go and buy... Like, when, when the next Dragon Ball Z video game comes out, they can they can go and buy um, Budokai Tenkaichi instead of buying whatever the new game is, like Kakarot or whatever the fuck the new one is. Um, and it's like, you know, that's a, a... You know, that's an issue, where like, I can compare it to a game that came out 15 years ago or 20 years ago and be like, oh, this is objectively better. Like, say Hogwarts Legacy comes out and it sucks, and it's like, well what about these other Harry Potter games that came out in the past? Like, I know me personally, I played uh, Chamber of Secrets, and that game was, you know, pretty good, all things considered for the era, for, for being an open-world game. And it's like, you know, if we look at, like, you know, what that is, it's kind of a, an important thing to be able to say, like, look, we can point to what happened here and be like, look, in the past, EA did X, Y, and Z with this game. In the past, Avalanche has made Attack on the Power of Juju. We know what these companies can do. We know we and, and we and and that's I think the you know the big thing about having open access. And what's going to happen is if we get to a point where old used games have the same market value as new games, actually more market value arguably than new games, the prices are going to go through the roof and become a po- and make a point where we can't afford it. And, and it, it makes it harder. And I think that's part of it. Because, like, if you go in and you look at, like, the stores for all these things, these companies aren't going to put these games in their on, in their online stores. We're not going to hit this utopia where you can go on to, to, you know, the PlayStation Store and every PlayStation game ever made from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 5 is going to be available for purchase in one spot. That's never going to happen. Never going to happen. But what they are going to do is make it that way. If you manage to get your hands on a copy of Crash Bandicoot or Twisted Metal or, or any number of other PlayStation 1 games, yeah, you can play it on your PlayStation. But what's going to happen is these games have been out of production for 5, 10, 20 years. And and while that is the case, that these games have been out of production for that long and, and you know all of that, the issue pops up that I you, you can't access... It's going, what's going to happen is it's a supply and demand thing where there's no additional copies of these games being made because they're not just not going to make them. They're not going to take away, you know, production from a new game that's going to make them a fuck ton of money to be like, oh, let's put out a, a few copies of this. And especially when they can do a few copies of whatever game it is that, you know, um, that, you know, insert game here. Um, if they can do that without being like, hey, we're going to... Like... All right, let's. I, I fell down a Sims rabbit hole yesterday, so we're gonna use you know EA's Sims franchise. I think it was owned. It wasn't owned by EA initially, but let's use Theme Park World Two or Theme Park Roller Coaster as it was known on the PlayStation Two. Um, I played the fuck out of that game when it, it was one of the first games I had for PlayStation Two. It was a it was a, a theme park building simulator, as the name would suggest. Um, so I, I played this game to death, and I still have I still have it. I, if I put it on my PlayStation Two, it'll still play. Um, herein is this, you know, this causes this cool thing where now if I want to play it, it, you know, I can, if, if they update the PlayStation 5 and I get a PlayStation 5, um, and, and it is backwards compatible and it's all the way back to PlayStation 2, I put the disc in, I play the game and the game will play. Um, you know, cool. That That's really cool. But now say someone else wants to wants to play this game. Someone else who's not me. Now, EA has no incentive to put this game out on the shop unless there's, like, huge amounts of support for it, and they manage to find all the assets for the original and and, and do that. Because it's like, even like Kingdom Hearts, they lost all the assets to the original Kingdom Hearts. So Kingdom Hearts 1 was built from the ground up for 1.5 for the PlayStation 3 when that came out. So say that happens. Say I do, um, like, like, you know, do that. And I, 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 I do all of this, and I and I play this game, and now I want to, you know, someone else wants to play it too. They have to buy one of the very limited supply of these games that are in circulation, um, and it's not being additional copies are not being made 
So it's just whatever is there is there. And, and if they're not there, tough shit. Like, I, I think that... Um, what's it called? I think that the, the big thing is that if we look at, you know, like... I think Kingdom Hearts is the best example of this. Um, because Kingdom Hearts is probably the closest to Star Wars of any video game. In so much as there was an original cut of Kingdom Hearts. There was an original version of Kingdom Hearts that did not come out in America. That's the final mix. And the final mix came out in Japan only. Um, even recoded... Or not recoded. Like, there are certain Kingdom Hearts games that are not available to play because... They were on the DS and not on the eShop, so you can't play them anywhere. You can find them online. And then when they ported these games to the PlayStation, they did not port the, you know, these games. They just ported the cutscenes, and that would be recoded in 358. Um, and, and, and Unchained, or whatever the hell the other one was. I forgot the name of the, the, the mobile game that was fun for, like, a week, and then you're like, fuck it, it's not worth playing. Um, but, like, all of these games don't exist in a... What's the one looking for? They don't exist in a vacuum. If I am making a... You know, if I'm if I'm playing a Kingdom Hearts game, um, I don't... Um, I'm not playing the game that I would have played in 2002. Like, if I, if I buy Kingdom Hearts 1.5, 2.5 for the PlayStation 4, I'm not playing the same game, not even in the same way as, like, oh, the graphics are better now. Like, they updated the graphics, but, like, there were rebalances that were put into the game, there were, uh, new bosses added, um, and, and things changed. Kingdom Hearts 2 is worse, I mean, not worse, they made it better, but, like, in the original cut of Kingdom Hearts 2, if you played Kingdom Hearts 2, not Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, which you only get from Japan, if you played Kingdom Hearts 2, you didn't fight Roxas. Roxas was not a boss fight in Kingdom Hearts 2, in, in the original cut. It was a cutscene. You watched that cutscene, and then you moved on. Um, the entire, you know, like, uh, synthesis had to be reworked from the ground up for Kingdom Hearts 2 because they completely changed things just to, you know, to when they added in new shard types, the Remembrance Shard, and there was another one. Um, but when they rebalanced that, they had to redo everything for that game functionally. Um, and and the, the, the lingering, or the, the lasting remnant, or the, the lingering remnant, or the whatever the fuck that thing was called. But all these things are, are things that are no longer available. Um, and you can't play the original Kingdom Hearts 2 unless you get a PlayStation 2 or you get one of the models of a PlayStation 3 that was back compatible very early on in their, um, very early on in their development. If you get one of those, you can, you can do, what's it called? You can do, what's what I'm looking for here? You, you can, you can play that version of the game. But if you buy the new one, you can't. You, you, you just can't. And that's, I'm not saying it's good or bad, that you can or can't, in the same way that you can't watch the original Star Wars without finding a VHS and, and playing the VHS. Like, you can't watch Star Wars without the scene with um, Jabba the Hutt added in, um, or without Han moving his head in an ungodly way, to, to, so that way he doesn't shoot first. You can't... You know, you can't watch Revenge of the... Uh, not Revenge of the Sith. Uh, Return of the Jedi without that weird, you know, thing that looks like the mascot for Honeycomb um, singing that song um, in that scene. Like, it's not exactly something that needed to be changed, but it was what George Lucas wanted, and, and he got what he wanted. Same thing with... I forget the name of the director of Kingdom Hearts, but he wanted to make these changes. He made the changes. Whatever, it more power to him. But for the sake of us, the the viewer, or the player, and all of that, the ability to see and play the original is a big deal. And it's not just for the fact of oh, I played the original or, or some kind of gatekeeping thing. It's more from the fact of you know the way we would watch. Like if they, if we got to a point where we were restoring movies and we restored them to the point where it's like we're restoring color and we're, rest we're restoring all of this. Like when they recolored, it's a wonderful life. They didn't take away the black and white version of It's a Wonderful Life. They just added a color version to it. And 
while there's an argument who made that they shouldn't have colorized it because it's, you know, it's not what was available with technology at the time, whatever, they colorized it. Nothing we can do about that. But what, what should be said is that if we got to a point where they didn't make um, black and white versions of It's a Wonderful Life, like if we went to, um, what's it called? If we went to uh, Best Buy to buy It's a Wonderful Life and they only sold the colorized version and I went to the Amazon uh, Prime store where I can buy, we can buy movies and you only had the color version. You went to like Fandango now and it was only the color version and you couldn't get the black and white version anymore. That's, you know, a problem because then it's, you're, you're messing with the fidelity of the original and, and in no other art form do we do that. Um, so I think that that's the other problem that comes in with, with back compatibility is that we're going to see an age where these things that were like this aren't going to be as readily available. Um, and they're not absolutely necessary for the maximum enjoyment of the, of, of the product and, and, and the game. Um, but it certainly helps from a historical standpoint if we're going to keep track of what was made when... How does it relate to pop culture at large? How did it impact pop culture at large? Because that's the thing, too, is that, you know, we can, like, if it got to a point where we never were able to see the original cut of Star Wars, everything about, like, oh, Han shot first, that loses all meaning. And that became a part of pop culture. Where things that may live on past it that have that reference don't have that you know, there, there is no reference point anymore for it, where it's like, oh, so what happened was, back in, you know, the early 90s, George Lucas was going to remake parts of Star Wars um, for its theatrical for its theatrical re-release and for the home media in advance of the prequel trilogy. So he, he made some changes, and in those changes, he altered, you know, he made it so that way Greedo shot at Han before Han shot him. Shot him. And it's like, you know, things like that, that are... You know, and it seems like a small gripe at the end of the day. It seems like a small gripe. Um, and, and no one's taking away things, but what it's doing is if we put back compatibility in with this already limited market for these games, it's on one hand going to make games more accessible, but it's more accessible for people who are more wealthy. And I think video games have a long way to go in terms of accessibility. Like, there are entire genres that are defined by games that came before it. Like, if I say, like, oh, that game's a roguelike, it's like, well, what the fuck does that mean? Like, oh, it means that it's, you know, a dungeon crawler. Like, a Castlevania-like is a game that's a 2D, 2D side scroller with a giant map that, is, as you unlock things in the story, you gradually unlock more parts of the map. Oh, okay, but, like, you know, there's there's no easier way to say that without saying, oh, it's, like, Castlevania. Oh, it's a, du or, you know, dungeon crawler instead of roguelike. Like, like, that's really stupid, but, you know, when it comes down to things like this, it's kind of like, you know, in there's a lot of inherent gatekeeping the video games, and I think that they, the, the issue is we're not spending enough time trying to take these things down. And what's going to end up happening is if we get to a point where it's like, oh, so, you know, anyone with a PlayStation can play any PlayStation game ever. Um there is no incentive to keep prices down on these games. And I think that, you know, as demand will inherently go up, because now it's like if I have a PlayStation, I can go into a local game store or like a thrift store or a um, or, or a liquidator and you just be like, oh, I want to buy this. Well, that's going to cost you more now. Um, and I think that, like, there are games that, like, have very little value now that will suddenly gain market value. Um, I think old sports games... I could see getting in very hot, especially uh, from franchises that don't exist, like MVP Baseball, which was great, by the way. Triple Play Baseball, also great. Um, ESPN very briefly had an, an, a line of games, um, a, a line of sports games. Um, also, you know, pretty awesome. But, like, you know, these things could see a markup because they're not going to make them anymore. Games from companies that no longer exist are going to go through the roof as well. Like, if, if I, like, you know, I'm trying to think of a game company that no longer exists. Like, I think a lot of, you know, or, or franchises that are long dead are going to go through the roof, too. So, like, you know, um, I was using The Sims. I fell on that rabbit hole yesterday, but, like, Sim Animals, My Sims, things like that. My Sims is a pretty fun game. 
uh, My Sims Kingdoms too. Those are pretty fun games, and and those like if you like, you know, that's something that would see a instant you know rise in value as a result of you know us now being able to play these games on a PlayStation. Uh, Sims Two Castaways, um, like is it made anymore? Like or like think of it like this too. Like you know again using the Sims. Without backward com- with with backward compatibility becoming what it is, you know it's it's good and bad in so much as now we can look at you know the differences between console versions and PC versions, and now more people can be hands on with that and not read about an Wikipedia article. Um, so like while more people are going to have access to it, it's also going to limit inherently because of the constricted supply and the and the demand being through the roof, and I think that could b- become problematic. Um, to an extent. Um, but yeah, and the reason all this came up was there was an accidental update to a PlayStation, to PlayStation 5s, that changed the, the trophy system to include, um, all past generation, not just PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5. It was, like, PlayStation 4 and then prior generations. Um, so it's, like, that kind of thing, you know... It, 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 it's going to do that. And I, I and don't get too excited. I don't think we're going to get to a point where they're going to add on um, additional, like, what's it called? Add on additional games or add achievements for old games. I think they're just referring to PlayStation 3. Um, but, yeah. Because even like, if you played a PlayStation 1 Classic on a PlayStation 3 or on a PSP, they didn't have achievements for them or trophies. I'm sorry. Um, so we'll wrap up there for today. Uh, and we'll be back. Um, with more, whenever more happens. So until then, have a great rest of your week.